Congressman Ron Paul is talking to us here in Washington, D.C. about the situation in Egypt, the future of the conservative movement, and a possible presidential run in 2012. Congressman, thank you so much for being here. Congressman Paul, let's start off with Egypt. Uh, as usual, you have a very different take on the situation in Egypt, something that many lawmakers, most lawmakers, aren't even talking about. You say that this is our 30-year mistake, that this, this mess happened because of U.S. foreign policy. What do you mean by that? Well, we had a lot to do with uh, Mubarak being in power and staying in power. Like, we subsidize him. We own him. He's our puppet dictator. He does what we tell him because he gets so much money. He's gotten probably 60 to $70 billion, and I understand his family probably has 60 or $70 billion stashed away in Swiss accounts and other places around the world. So we've owned him, and, uh, and, and we're supposed to get you know, perpetual peace and uh, cooperation, but in times, uh, uh, after a time, the people rebel against this. They know about it, and they see dictators as being nothing more than puppets of the United States style government, and they rebel, and that's what they've done. So uh, even though there's been stability and we could afford it over those years, now there's no stability and we can't afford it anymore. So the sooner we quit this foreign policy of uh, subsidizing people, and they say, well, he's our only friend. If we have to pay that much money for a friend, he's not much of a friend, the way I figure. And you go so far as to say, just stop the aid, whether it is to Egypt or Afghanistan or Pakistan or Israel, just stop the aid. Do you think that would actually ever happen? Probably not, it, not deliberately and, uh, you know, uh, in a fashion where we legislate it, but it may stop when we go broke. You know, what did, what did the, the Soviet system do? Did They had to quit subsidize everybody immediately and they had to walk away from it. And the world survived, and Russia survived, everybody survived, you know, with that. But I, I'd much rather see it come through legislation rather than waiting, waiting for a real crisis to build and have a monetary crisis. And under those circumstances, we just can't send them any more money because the money won't buy anything. So I'm trying to prevent a precipitous and a really disruptive system of it breaking down. People will argue, well, it's disruptive just to cut it off, but, uh, well, if you wanted to cut off 25% for four years, maybe that's a compromise, but I, I, my personal opinion is you just cut it off. But your critics would say, look, we have to look out for the best interest of the United States. Therefore, we cannot have a non-interventionist foreign policy because it wouldn't help us, it would only hurt us. Well, I guess if they looked at the facts, they'd find out that intervention hasn't helped us very well very much at all, because if you look at how many Americans have been killed in Korea and Vietnam and the Middle East and around the world and how many other, uh, how much collateral damage there's been and how many civilians have been killed around the world, I would say that uh, hasn't done us a bit of good and it's helped move us toward our own bankruptcy. So I don't believe our, our national security required it. I think we're less safe for it. Uh, the threat of terrorism is related to our foreign policy. So I feel less safe because we're over there. I never feel safer for the foreign policy that we have today. Here's something that shocked a lot of people. This is something that you had mentioned. The Telegraph reported on it. It was part of the WikiLeaks uh, revelations. The fact that the United States was actually supporting uh, some of these activists that we saw on the streets for, for several years now. How do we make sense of that? Because surely the United States doesn't want to see instability there, but on the other hand, they were either paying these activists or supporting them. They were here in the United States. We're, we're always involved on both sides. If, 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 uh, if our puppet dictator can last, we keep propping him up. When we see the tide changing, then I'm sure our CIA is involved in the opposition. They can be in early or late, or they try to pick up the pieces. That doesn't mean they have total control. You know, we controlled uh, the Iranian situation. We had the Shah in there for a while, but eventually the next revolution, we didn't have control. And then we end up with the Ayatollah. So long term, I, I think it hurts us. On the short term, we will always try to buy the influence and stay involved and convince the American people that our national security will be threatened if we don't control these governments. I just don't believe that. You know, obviously the Conservative Political Action Conference is going on now, and I think that a lot of folks over there would disagree with a lot of your views, especially when it comes to foreign policy. And now, especially this year with Go Proud being included uh, in the conference and you winning the straw poll last year, there's this sort of fear, as, as they say, that CPAC is becoming more libertarian. Why do you think that for some folks that's such a dirty word? Oh, how horrible. 
<laughs> CPAC is going to be stronger for liberty. <laughs> I see that as wonderful. You know, libertarian. I mean, this is why some folks boycotted this year. Yeah, I saw that comment. So he said, I'm not coming there more libertarian. I didn't know libertarian was a bad word. To me, libertarian is a wonderful word. That, that means we believe in liberty. We believe in our Constitution. We believe in the Fourth Amendment, the, the whole works. And we believe why is it in causing such a rift then in the Republican Party? Because uh, some people. Some people uh, who call themselves conservative are big government conservatives. So my opposition are big government conservatives and big government liberals. I want libertarians and constitutional conservatives who say that we'll follow the Constitution, we believe in personal liberty, and they come from our old right tradition. So th there is a tradition in the Republican Party that objects to us policing the world. So although you hear that and they've had lots of influence these last several decades, uh, there's still a lot of influence uh, in the past, at least, uh, by Republicans who believed in, uh, in limited government and a non-interventionist foreign policy. What do you think their ideal America looks like, though? Some of those bigger government conservatives. What, what did they want to see happen? Well, they feel that uh, America is exceptional and that we're very special. In some ways, I agree with that. But their conclusion is because we're exceptional and so special, that we have this uh, neo-Jacobinism where we have this moral obligation to spread our goodness even if we have to use force. And that was all what the French Revolution was about. See, the difference with me is I believe there's a lot of good traits and a lot of good qualities about Americans, belief in liberty and markets and freedom and sound money, but we should spread our goodness in our, by setting an example. That's the difference. The idea that, they, that somebody would use force to make other countries act like we do or make individuals act like we think they should rejects the whole notion of liberty because we reject the notion of using force to mold people's lives and change the world. So that's where the separation is on big government conservatives and more libertarian constitutionalists because uh, we, we believe we can persuade people rather than forcing people to uh, accept our views and act the way we do. And you know CPAC is usually a platform or perhaps a test uh, for future presidential candidates. Are you going to be one of them in 2012? Well, I'm going to be a speaker at CPAC, uh, but I have uh, truthfully uh, no decision to make. I am undecided and uh, I, some days I am a, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea because I have a lot of supporters urging me to. And then there are other days I think, well, you know, maybe I have better things to do or other things to do. So I am still undecided. And I have a couple months to make a decision. I don't know if you got a chance to see this, but there was an article circulating on the internet amongst your supporters. And the title of it was A Radical Idea. Ron Paul runs as a Democrat in 2012. And it basically listed all of the quote unquote good reasons as to why you should run as a Democrat. For example, your anti-war views, uh, the fact that you want to end the drug war and many Republicans associate, you know, smoking a joint with immorality. Uh, have you ever considered that running as a Democrat? Yeah, yeah, I have, but then I realize it's impractical. But I, it would be great to do it because it would just just drive the progressives nuts because they would be agreeing with me, but they wouldn't be able to stand the idea of supporting somebody like me because I don't address, I, I don't endorse their principles of redistribution of wealth, you know, from one group to another. So there's a limit. They might agree with me on civil liberties and war, and they would, and we could expose the. Uh, the conflicts and the inconsistency of our president because he has the endorsement of the progressives, but they get annoyed too because he's up there promoting war and didn't do anything about the drug war and all, all these things and promotes the Patriot Act and endorses assassinations and secret prisons, nothing really changed. So that would, that would really stir the hearts of the progressives, but the progressives would say, oh yeah, but he doesn't want to give more food stamps to the American people. And, you know, it's back to that. But it's an interesting thing. It's fascinating to think about. Congressman Paul, as always, thank you so much. Thank you.